begin in a few minutes. For those of you who are followers of Jesus, be sure to grab communion elements on your way in. If it's your first time with us, either online or in person, we wanna say a special welcome to you. We'd love to connect with you, answer any questions you might have, and share more about our church. Visit cpcc.church, and you guessed it, click on I'm New, and that's where you can fill out a guest information card. At the bottom of the card, we've listed four local partnerships. Choose the one that resonates with you the most, and we'll make a donation to that ministry on your behalf as a way of saying thanks for being our guest today. Our mission at Centerpoint is to help people find and follow Jesus. For those of you who are regular givers and who are serving here, it's your contribution that helps lead us toward that mission. We wanna say thank you. There are three ways you can give to the mission here at Centerpoint. On our website, on our app, or in the white offering boxes on your way out. Thanks again. Before worship begins, take a minute to check out what's happening here at Centerpoint. Hi, my name is Jenny Bussey, and I'm the student pastor here at Centerpoint. I just wanted to drop a quick reminder about Centerpoint students. We are currently offering student worship and small groups every Sunday downstairs in our student center. Middle school, grades six through eight, meets on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. And high school, grades nine through 12, Sunday evenings from six to 8 p.m. Students, if you're a little shy about joining us on Sunday, we have an event coming up that might be the perfect introduction. All students, grades six through 12, are invited to kick off the big game at our tailgate party on February 12th at noon in the Student Center. Food, games, and prizes. If you're feeling brave, test your skills and compete in our second annual CPSM Combine. Bring your favorite snack food to share and your friends. Let's go, we'll see you there. If you are a Christian working in a secular job, you understand the challenges of living out your faith in the workplace. Do you sometimes feel you need to advocate for causes you don't believe in? Would you like to live out your faith comfortably without offending others? Well, the Faith at Work Summit addresses these challenges and provides you with practical tools and techniques to confidently live out your faith at work. Join us in learning and exchanging of Faith at Work ideas with other Christians on Saturday, February 25th from 8.30 to noon right here at Centerpoint. You can find out more and register at cpcc.church slash events. Hey, Libby. Oh, hey, Tammy. I'm so excited to see a movie. I am too. What's the last movie you saw? You know, it's really been a while because like, it's so cold out and <laughs> I don't like to leave, but it's so expensive. It is expensive, especially for a family to go I to know. a movie right now. When you get snacks and everything. So. Oh, I know. The, the, the big, large popcorn. Oh, I don't yeah. even know how much that costs anymore. And the candy. I, oh, yeah. yeah. All right. So here's the good news. What? We've got a free yes. movie night right Come here, on. right here at Centerpoint in our big worship room. We're going to show a movie on that big, humongous LED screen. It's going to be fantastic. Yep. And you know what? It's free. It's free. And we're going to have popcorn and we're going to have candy. What's your favorite candy? Oh, probably, gosh, movie candy. I kind of like the M&Ms in the box. M&Ms in the box. Mm -hmm. How about M&Ms inside your popcorn? Oh, yeah. It doesn't get better than but, that. I'm yeah. telling you. We yep. will have candy. We will have popcorn. We will have maybe some prizes for the yep. kids. And it'll be nice and toasty warm here, too. Yeah. And you know what? It is Friday, February 17th, which is President's Day weekend, which means, well, it's a Friday night, so you don't have school the next day, but I think you're off of school that the whole on Monday, yeah, too. Yeah, nice so long weekend. You need something to do. So come on Friday night, February 17th. The movie starts at 7. Okay. Come a little early to get your treats and get all set. Bring a blanket if you want to. Bring a friend. Bring a friend. Bring a pillow. Yep. Wear your pajamas. Yep. Wear whatever you want. That's right. pants. It's family movie night. So bring your entire family. It's going to be a ton of fun. And we can't wait to see you there. Yep. And that's what's happening here at Centerpoint. It's time to grab your coffee and head into the worship center. If you're a follower of Jesus, make sure to grab communion elements as you make your way to your seat. We will be using them together at the appointed time during the service.
Good morning, Center Point family. Would you stand and let's start in worship this morning? Your heart is full.
God, you are faithful and you always will be. And we stand in your presence this morning just grateful for your providence, grateful for the provision that only comes from you. We celebrate that this morning. In your son's name, amen. Good morning. You may be seated. Welcome to Center Point Christian Church. We are so excited to worship with you today. If you are new here, if this is your first time either online or here in this room, we just want to say a special welcome to you and let you know that we're so glad that you're here. And we would love to share with you a little bit more information about our church and to get to know you a little bit better. And the best way to do that is to go to cbcc.church and click on the I'm New tab. And um, there there's, you'll find a guest information card, and we would just love to follow up with you. And, um, and again, so we're just so excited you're here today. This is one of my favorite days. Um, and one of, our, one of our core values is thriving families. And the family was God's original plan to bring his kingdom here on earth. And our deepest, deepest desire is to equip and resource our families so that they can fulfill their God-given purpose to our community and to the world to show God's redemption story. Um, That's our deepest desire. And so one of our strategies is celebrating milestones. And a milestone is a significant moment in the life of a family. Usually it happens uh, once um, or twice. And we want to help parents be intentional in that phase of life that they're in. And so today is Baby Celebration Sunday, one of my favorites. Um, And we're so glad to share this milestone event with our parents. They've had, um, these are parents who've had children over the last year or so. And CB Kids and CB Students, we pour a ton of staffing, hours, resources, and energy into ministering to these sweet, precious kids, your kids. And we love serving them in our environments on Sunday morning. And we love sharing God's story with them. And we don't want them to just know God's story. We want them to know how they fit into God's story. And we want them to know how to love him and serve him and honor him. And so today we have 15 families that are participating in our baby celebration. And you're going to see about half of those families today because the the first hour we we celebrated some. Um, But I'm going to introduce you to them at this time. Um, And you're just going to be ooing and aahing, I'm sure. Um, Our first baby is today is Gavin Lee Boyce. Gavin's parents are Andrew and Kylie. Gavin has three older sibs who look after him, Ashlyn, Gracelyn, and Mackenzie. Our next um, sweet, precious child is Maddox Charles Bryant. Maddox's amazing mom is Mariah. Leah Josephine Eby. Leah's parents are Rob and Caitlin, And her big sis is Lily. Winslow, Elsla, Egan. Winslow's parents are Aaron and Nicole, and her siblings are Abel and Arbor. Kobe, Michael, Light. Kobe's parents are Bobby and Sonia, and his big sis is Callie. Next, we have Camden Retner. Camden is the firstborn of Ben and Kylie. And we've got Hayden, Matthew, and Ella Grace Snipes. These sweet kiddos belong to Evan and Lauren. Aren't they beautiful? Can we just give them a round of applause? So this afternoon, we're going to hold a special milestone event for these families and their invited guests. They're going to stand um, with each other, and they're going to commit to raising their child to find and follow Jesus. And they're going to commit to modeling what it looks like to live each day as a follower of Jesus who loves and serves him. But... 
These kiddos need more than just their parents, right? It takes a village. And that's where you guys come in. Because the Bible says to bear one another's burdens, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those with mo- who mourn. And we are to be in the ups and downs of family together. So for our church family, we want you guys to take this responsibility in, before God. And in view of this responsibility, I charge you who are members that you will do all that you can to support and provide a place of worship where these children may hear and absorb God's word. I charge you that you will set a Christ-like example by your lives and to maintain an atmosphere that inspires these kids to follow Jesus. I charge you to pray for their salvation so that on the day when they're old enough that they choose to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So for those of you in this room who are willing to accept this charge, would you please answer, with God's help, we will. Thank you. At this time, Ralph Newfarth, one of our elders, he's going to come and and pray over our families and and just share a couple words. Thank you, Tammy. Good morning, Centerpoint. Step back with you. So before I ask you to pray with me for these families, I would just like to mention something that uh, I've reflected on a lot this past week. Many of you here at Centerpoint know the Perry family. My wife and I had the privilege of going to Bob Sr.'s memorial service this past Monday. Now, here was a man among men, a graduate of the Naval Academy, a highly decorated military career, three tours in Vietnam as a helicopter pilot. On one mission, he flew for several hours, going back to refuel and coming back several times so that he wouldn't leave six of his Marine Corps brothers behind. He was able to finally rescue them. Now that's a real hero. But Bob, in his humility, he knew that he needed a hero to save and rescue him. And that, of course, is Jesus. His son, Bob Perry Jr., gave an amazing eulogy And he mentioned all these many things that his father achieved, but it was clear that the greatest thing was his faith legacy in Jesus. You know, despite all that Bob achieved, and they were extraordinary, he never found his identity in anything he did, but he found his identity in Jesus and what Jesus did for him. As we sat there and we saw the many family and friends coming to celebrate and honor Bob's life, it occurred to me that it took way more than a lot of vocational and military heroics for the family to gather and honor him the way they did. You see, after his military career, he even became an attorney and a mayor of his town and served publicly for years after that. But that's not why they were there. They were there because of Bob's genuine love and care for his family and friends, his, his love for Jesus. And that is what it takes, and that's what's at the, at the heart of thriving families. And I'm so thankful to be in a church like Centerpoint that makes that such a strong emphasis as one of their core values. You know, Mother Teresa said, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. I don't think she was too far off with that. It's much needed. So if you would, please pray with me as I lead the prayer for these families. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, first and foremost, we want to give you praise. And we certainly give you praise for family as you designed it. Lord, it is your creation. And as you said, it is good. Father, we lift up these families to you today, and we are so encouraged by their intentionality to just follow you in raising and nurturing their children. We ask for your power and protection over them, Lord, as they navigate through a, 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 frankly, a, a culture that's becoming more hostile all the time. 
and a society that's truly lost its identity. Father, we just ask for you to help us here at Center Point to be a safe haven for them, to provide the resources and support they need to fulfill what is perhaps the greatest calling on their lives. We ask that you guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, would you all stand and greet someone this morning? Find someone that you don't know and maybe give them a big old shout of a who day uh, to your neighbor. If you are uh, new with us, we are in the middle of a series called uh, Renewed, where we're taking a look at six practices that will help us live well in a difficult world, six practices that will, that will lead us, help lead us at least, to a renewed life. Week one, week one, we talked about the soul and what the soul is and what the soul needs. Week two, we talked about the practice of rest. Last week, we talked about the practice of solitude. So if you missed any of those messages that are on our website, you can go back uh, and catch up. But after today, you'll never have to bother catching up again uh, because you'll never, ever miss church again after today's message. <clears throat> We're going to look at the practice, the discipline of corporate worship and why it's fundamental to your faith uh, and I'm so glad this wasn't last week's message because we're only like 97 of you here last week. So, uh, but hey, I, no, uh, no worries for staying home. I don't blame you. I almost called in myself. So <clears throat> I've heard people say before, and you've probably heard this too. Maybe you've said this. I don't need to go to church to worship. I, I, can, I can worship on my own. I don't need, I don't need the church for that. And, and what that tells me is that person really doesn't know what they need. Because that's a really spiritually immature uh, statement. It's like your kids going to school this time of year in shorts and a t-shirt. Like, how many got that going on? <clears throat> and going, I don't need long sleeves. I don't need, I don't need a coat. How many adults do you see doing that this time of year? There's some. Thank you for your confession. <clears throat> but not many, not many. And what's the difference? Maturity, like as we got older, we realized that, that long sleeves and layers are good. They're, a good. they're good things. And so the more you grow in your faith, the more you understand the importance of corporate worship. Uh, the Greek word translated as church in our New Testament is the word ekklesia, and it means a gathering of people called out for a specific purpose. A gathering of people called out for a specific purpose. Jesus intended for his church to come together, to worship together. In fact, Christianity was launched during a corporate worship service. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit entered the room where about 120 Jesus followers were gathered together, worshiping and praying, and the church was born. So it's safe to say that one of the most Christian things you can do is go to church. Now, here's the truth. I'm going to give it to you up front that I want you to leave with today. So if you walk out and go, I don't really know what that was all about. It's about this. Worship isn't about us. It's about God. What we do here is not about us. It's about God. The reason we go to church is for God. Just showing up here today 
was an act of worship on your part because you made a decision of your own volition to give up whatever else you could have been doing during this time. That is an act of worship. And when you decide not to go to church, when you are fully capable uh, of going, uh, you're not sick, you're not out of town, you're also making a decision of your own volition to not give up whatever it is that you didn't want to give up that day. That's also an act of worship. It's just worship of the wrong thing. See, we're all worshipers. If you're, a, if you're breathing, you're worshiping. Uh, if, if you're an atheist, you're not a Jesus follower, whatever, you're, you're, you're still a worshiper. There's no such thing as a non-worshiper. Uh, Webster's defines it this way, that uh, it's an extravagant respect or admiration for or devotion to an object of esteem. Now, we all have something or someone who, who, who takes this space right here in our lives. We all have an object of esteem. The question is, who or what is your object of esteem? Maybe, maybe it's a dream uh, that you've had since a child. You, you had this dream of doing something specific, and, and, and you're still working toward that, moving toward that, and it, it is the object of your uh, esteem. Maybe it's a position or a title. Maybe it's a status. Maybe it's a, a career. Maybe it's your house. Maybe it's your stuff. Maybe it's your money. Maybe it's a person, your spouse, your, your kids. Maybe it's you. Maybe you worship yourself. The word for that is, is narcissism. I know some of those folks. You may know some of those folks. They're self-worshippers. But there is no such thing as a non-worshipper. Everybody worships something. The first two of the Ten Commandments are about worship. Before God tells Israel how to relate to one another, he sets the foundation for the entire law. Number one, don't worship any other gods before me. Don't have any other gods before me. Number two, don't replace me with an idol. He left no possibility that we wouldn't worship something. Because as the creator, he knows better. He designed us. He wired us for worship. We will either worship him or we will worship something else. And when we worship God, we get the rest of the list right See, breaking a commandment is simply misplaced worship. That's what that is. The reason people lie is because they're worshiping something other than God. They're lying to protect their image, or they're lying to protect a job, or to protect their money, their stuff. If they didn't esteem it, they wouldn't lie about it. The reason people steal is because they're worshiping something other than God. There's something they don't have that they believe they need in order to bring value and meaning to their life. If they didn't esteem it, they wouldn't have stolen it. Behind every single commandment is the priority of God as our object of worship, our object of esteem. That's why Jesus summed up the entire law by saying, hey, the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, nothing is to be esteemed more than God himself. And when God is the ultimate uh, object of your esteem, you will naturally love other people. So the most important thing is to worship the right thing. Like we can't afford to get this wrong. The most important thing that we can do as followers of Jesus is to worship the right thing. And so it's 100% true that you don't need to go to church to worship. You will worship on your own. You will worship something. But if you want to worship the right thing, you, you need this. You can't do it without the church. You can't do it without the people of God. That's why corporate worship is fundamental to your faith. It's really easy to worship the wrong thing alone, but it's really difficult to worship the wrong thing with other people. It's the reason that the writer of Hebrews writes this in chapter 10. He says, let us hold on to the confession of our, of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful, and let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. John Eldridge in his uh, book, Get Your Life Back, which I've mentioned in this series, he says, life has a way of eroding our confidence in God. 
Life has a way of eroding our confidence in God. I think we all feel that. Life is hard. It's a daily battle. Sometimes it's an hourly grind. Right? Your job is great until there's turmoil and upheaval and you question the goodness of God. You, you, you married the love of your life and now you know, five years in, six years in, the relationship is really struggling and you, you question the goodness of God. You went for a routine uh, checkup and they found something and now the C word has become part of your vocabulary instead of just somebody else's and you question the goodness of God. Those questions are absolutely normal, but they are not answered well in isolation. Life doesn't get easier alone. It only gets harder. The writer of Hebrews knew this. He was writing to a group of people who had left their Jewish faith to become Jesus followers. And in the first century, this was almost a certain death sentence. They were enduring extreme persecution. Life for them was eroding their confidence in God. And many of them were walking away from their faith and returning to Judaism. They were walking away from Jesus, and one of the reasons is because they were giving up the habit of meeting together. The central theme of the entire book of Hebrews is right here in these two verses. Hold on, hold on to the confession of your hope. Don't let go. Don't waver. Consider one another, how we might provoke one another, spur one another on to love and and good works. Don't neglect the gathering. Don't neglect the gathering. Be together to encourage one another. He was imploring them to make the gathering a priority. And those words are still relevant to us 2,000 years later. See, when we walk in this room every week, it reminds us that we are that we are not alone. And one of the reasons I love the design of this room is because you can see each other just a little bit better. When we walk in this room, we realize we're not the only one. Like you're not the only one who had a difficult week. You're not the only one who got a life-changing diagnosis. You're not the only one who uh, was wounded by another person. This week. You're not the only one who's struggling with infertility in this room. You're not the only one who's lost a job. And when we realize that we're not the only one, it gives us hope. It restores our confidence in God. Like, God's not punishing me. That's not what's happening here. God's not punishing me. My experience is simply part of the broken world that we live in. See, we have this shared journey together that allows us to empathize with one another and encourage one another. When you really connect in uh, to the body and you build community with other people in this church, you find strength to hold on to your confession of hope. When you hear somebody else's story of loss, And how they overcome it, it gives you confidence that you can overcome it too. When you feel like giving up, you've got somebody who's provoking you to love and good works. You've got somebody who's pushing you, who's stirring you, who's spurring you on. It's hard to quit anything in community. See, together is the only way through. When we come in this room and we sing songs together, we're singing truth over each other. When we hear the same word taught from the stage, we're ingesting that truth together. At communion, we come around the Lord's table to share a meal of grace together. See, worship is a completely shared experience that gives us group identity. Our brains are wired to respond within the context of community. That's how God created them. He created us to do life with other people. Like throughout the Old Testament, God refers to the nation of Israel as his people. That their individual identity as well as their group identity were tied up in God. In the New Testament, that invitation is by grace through faith in Jesus to anyone who wants to step into it. 
If Jesus is your Lord today, you are part of the people of God. We're called the family of God, the children of God, the body of Christ, the the bride of Christ. Peter says it uh, this way. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the promises, so that you may worship the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. And as his people, we're called to live in a certain way. As God's people, there's a certain way that we look at the world. As God's people, there's a certain way that we respond to crisis. As God's people, there's a certain way that we behave when we're angry with another person. As God's people, there's a certain way that we treat our leaders, a certain way that we treat our spouse, a certain way that we view and spend money, a certain way that we view marriage and sex and sexuality. There's a certain way that we parent our kids. Listen, we're not going to get that right all the time, which is why we need this. It's why we need each other. Now, a few minutes ago, we had a group of young parents on the stage for baby dedication. Do you know why we do that every year? Because it's the only time that we can get Tammy to cry on stage. That's why we do it. (laughs) It's got a heart of stone. We, We don't do it because it's cute, and it is cute. We don't do it for the babies. They're not gonna remember this day. But the parents will never forget. Because when they stood up here, they looked out over this crowd and they saw their village, their community, their people who made a commitment to walk with them in the most difficult job they have. And what they left with is that, hey, I'm not doing this alone. I belong to a group. I have group identity with this body of believers. That's why belonging to the local church is so important. See, without regular uh, gathering together with a group of people, we forget really easily who we are. And we forget really easily how we're called to live in this world. Corporate worship reminds us. It reminds us who we are, and it reminds us of who God is. The songs that we sing, the word that we hear, the prayers we pray, the people we see every single week, it reminds us, it resets us, and it renews us. And without the we, you'll lose your way. If you don't have a we, you'll lose your way. The world erodes our confidence in God. But worship restores it. That's why this is so important. That's why you can't be fickle about this time on Sundays. That's why you can't make it optional. That's why it needs to be a high priority in your life. And that's why online can't be just fine. Online can't be just fine. Listen, I know you're not going to be here every week. All right, that's a pastor's pipe dream. Like we're not giving gold stars for perfect attendance but we're not above it. If that'll help, we'll give you stars. But I know you're not going to be here every week. There's, there's life, right? There's vacation. There's, there's work. There's kids' ball games and activities. Sunday, growing up, if you're my age, you know, around that, you know that Sunday, there was nothing going on. There was nothing open. There was nobody playing ball, you know, this, this age or kids' age. That's not the case anymore. And I don't, I don't think the culture is going to go back to that. Sunday is not a holy day. It is a busy day just like uh, every other day. And, and we, you know, Janelle and I navigated that. Our oldest uh, played baseball since he was nine years old, still plays in college. There were many a Sunday that, were, that was game day. And Janelle and Campbell, uh, they would miss church. I wouldn't. I made this a priority. I was here every week. Got stars to prove it. But sometimes they missed. We're not going to be legalistic 
about church attendance. That's not what this is. We started live streaming long before the pandemic because we wanted you to have the opportunity to, to stay connected while you were away, to keep up with what was going on at Center Point, to keep up with the series uh, while you were away. But that should be the exception and never the rule. Never the rule, because there's no substitute for corporate worship, especially in-person worship. Online is just fine if you're sick. Online is just fine if you're out of town. Online is just fine if you're a caregiver, and you got to make sure that you stay healthy, you're caring for somebody you know, in, your, in your family. You get it. Online is just fine. But online is not just fine just because that's what you prefer. Online isn't just fine because you, it's easier than getting up and getting yourself ready and getting everybody ready and getting out the door. Online isn't just, just fine if, if you, know, you want to sleep in. And here's, here's why. Because worship isn't about you. It's not about you. It's about God. And so we shouldn't neglect the gathering. We shouldn't minimize this. We shouldn't be cavalier about this because it's an expression. It's a corporate expression of our love for God and our love for each other. So it should be a high priority for those of us who follow Jesus. Martin Luther said this, at home, in my own house, there's no warmth or vigor in me. But in the church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through. Something happens, he says, when I'm with other people in worship. When we worship together, God gets bigger. Your problems get smaller. You get bolder because you realize you're part of something greater than just yourself. Now, I want to I spend a few minutes talking about one aspect, just one aspect of worship that I want you to give some consideration to, and that's, uh, that's singing. If you're new to church, like, it may seem a little weird what, what we do in here when we sing together because we don't do that in any other setting unless we're at a concert or a birthday party, <laughs> right? That's when we sing out loud. But if you read the Psalms, if you read the Psalms, you can't ignore the priority of music and singing. When Israel went into battle, almost every time, almost every time, they were led in by a group of musicians. The army followed the marching band. Now, there's one of two reasons for that. Either they were the most expendable, <laughs> or they set the tone. They motivated and inspired the army, you know this, music moves us. It moves us. There's something about a band at a football game or a basketball game that stirs us and excites us. There's something about an instrumental score in a movie that lifts the emotion from the screen and into our heart. Like you take away the theme song from Rocky and you just got Sylvester Stallone running the streets of Philadelphia. Like that's not... That's not motivating. That's not exciting. But the music, it makes you want to put a headband on and go out and run. To this day, to this day in Philadelphia, people who visit Philadelphia run up the steps of the Philadelphia Museum of Art because that's what they wanted to do when they saw the movie and couldn't. A few years ago, our family did that. We ran up, jumped around, you know, because it just, it, there's something about the music that changes things. Music makes or breaks a movie because it moves us from a spectator to a participant. That's what music does. Music is not worship. Music leads us to worship. It moves us in this room from a spectator to a participant. Worship was never intended to be passive. Worship is a response to who God is and what God's done. And so nothing about the Sunday morning, experience, Sunday morning experience is designed for you to just observe. Everything we do in this room from start to finish is to lead you to participate. Because worship involves the whole being. I love what uh, William Temple says about this. He says, to worship is to quicken the conscience 
by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote the will to the purpose of God. Every single aspect of our being is involved in worship. The mind, the body, the will, the soul. It is all laid on the altar of worship to respond to the goodness of God. Psalm 95 is one of the quintessential texts for worship. It says, come, let's shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let's enter, and let's is let us, right? It's plural, it's plural. Let's enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let's shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God. This is why we do it. A great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands form the dry land. Come, let's worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. Our whole personhood is involved in worship. So when you come to worship, you need to come with a posture of humility and expectancy. Humility and expectancy. Humility, because we're meeting with the God of the universe together. As his people, the throne room of heaven is open with a welcome sign. And we're invited in. That should humble us. And we come with expectancy because God wants to do something great among us. And I don't know some of you are thinking, you know, Sean, I, I, I get that, but, you know, music isn't really my thing. I, uh, I, don't, I'm not really, I don't really sing, not really into that. And I, I would say that's, that's totally fine if this were about you. But it's not about you. It's about God. And we are commanded to sing. Paul says this, in Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another through sermons, huh? through psalms, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. You know what he's saying? There's a sermon in the songs. There's a sermon in the songs we sing. The songs we sing, they teach, pay attention to the lyrics. They teach us. They admonish us. Especially the older hymns. Okay, we're not going to go there, all right? But listen, like that was how people learned doctrine. Was through hymns. The God who gave his son to die for you on the cross, he deserves a song. The God who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light and adopted you as a son and daughter deserves a song. So when music isn't your thing, but you sing anyway, that is a posture of humility. That is bowing low before the Lord your maker. And he will bless you because he knows your heart. Participating honors God. Spectating does not. So if you're not a music person, you're not a singer, I, I get that. But it doesn't, it doesn't absolve you. We don't sing because we love music. We sing because we love God. And it's one of the ways that we're commanded to respond to him. Singing is one of the most important things that we do in the worship service. Hebrews reminds us, the book of Hebrews reminds us that under the old covenant, worship required the sacrifice of bulls and goats. But under the new covenant of Jesus, worship requires a sacrifice of praise. 
It's what we do as part of our group identity. The music is what unites us together as the people of God. So listen, don't undermine that. Don't sit it out. Embrace it and participate in it. And the more you do, the more you will enjoy it. And here's why. Because the less it's about you. The more you do the thing you don't want to do, the less it becomes about you, and the more you will enjoy it. Two weeks ago, uh, a couple from our church, they offered us tickets to the Bengals' first playoff game at home against the the Ravens. Um, They had season tickets. They had other plans. And I said, listen, we we would love to gift these to you. You had me at gift. (laughs) I like gifts. People were paying hundreds of dollars you know, for these tickets. I hadn't been to a game in probably 12 years. And I don't know if you remember this, but 12 years ago, there was nothing worth cheering about, okay? <laughs> in fact, the reason I went is because somebody paid me to take their tickets. It was a, it was a side hustle I had. I'm, I'm, I'm taking people's tickets if you want to pay me to go. It was amazing. So <clears throat> when we got home from church, like we, we began to, to plan for the game. Kickoff was seven hours away, but, you know, we're trying to figure out what to wear because we want to we represent. We had friends downtown who were, who were tailgating, so we wanted to go down early. We've never tailgated ever. And so here's what I envisioned. I envisioned tailgates. Nope. <laughs> nope. No, I'm, uh, tents and TVs and tables and tables and tables of food, okay? We parked where, where our friends were tailgating and where we parked was like the opposite end of the city. They were close to Indiana, I think. But we, we walked over there and we walked through so many tailgates. I mean, you could just munch on your way through. If you are hungry, go downtown, put a Bengal shirt on. They will never know, right, that you are part of their group. You can get a good meal down there. So it's, it's just a thing. It's a whole culture. I had no idea. I, I mean, it's never, I've never done it before. The game started at 8.15. At 7.15, an hour before kickoff, we were walking into the stadium with thousands of our people right? All with expectation and anticipation. I knew they were our people because we all had the same uniform on, like your shirts, your hats, your jerseys. It all had the same name on the front. Like there was group identity in that. In fact, when I was in line for the bathroom before we went to sit down, uh, there's a guy that came, long lines, there's a guy that came up behind me just as two other guys were coming. It was kind of one of those awkward dances because it's like, well, should I get behind you? Or, and he apologized because he felt like he cut. And they're like, no, no, no. It's all good, man. You're one of us. You've got a Bengal shirt on, right? We got your back. That's what they said. No, no lie. Now, I had a Bengal shirt on too, but it was cold that night, so I had my ski jacket on, which is Detroit Lions colors, okay? It's not, it's not Ravens colors, but I felt the need to turn around so they knew that I was part of their group. <laughs> I'm with y'all. Y'all got my back in this bathroom? Got my posse right here going into the potty place, all right? So... Um, now, I, uh, we got to our seats like 45 minutes, 45 minutes before kickoff, and we, you know, just hanging out, took the obligatory selfie, and then, then kickoff happened, and everybody gets up at kickoff, and I, I thought we'd sit back down. Oh, no. No. Three hours. I stood on my feet. Three hours we stood and we cheered on our team. I'm telling you, we, we shouted joyfully. We clapped our hands. People were high-fiving us. I don't know who they are, but we're a group, right? We got our Bengal shirt on. We're all part of it. We even, a few different times, we even sang a song. It's like, who day? Do you know, have you guys heard this song? Like we were singing it together. I didn't hear anybody around me go, you know what? I don't really like that song. Nobody said, you know what, that's really not my thing. I don't chant, I don't sing, so I'm just going to set this out. Nobody did that. Now, I knew the song, but I'm telling you, not one time in my life have I sat home by myself in my man chair and sang that song out loud. Not one time. (laughs) But there, live experience, whole different ballgame. I'm in. These are my people. Who? Day. Okay? So, I didn't hear anybody. I didn't hear anybody around me complain about getting there early. I didn't hear anybody complaining about standing the whole time. Now, somebody may have heard me complain about it a little bit because that was a long time. Nobody complained. I didn't hear anybody complaining about the volume. 
It's weird. I didn't hear anybody complaining about the lines to the bathroom. I didn't hear anybody complaining uh, about uh, the crowd coming in or the parking lot and how crowded it was. Nobody left early. I'm just reporting to you what I saw and what I didn't see. <laughs> like it was almost, it, it was almost like they were just all glad to be there. It was almost like they were enjoying themselves, some a little too much. <laughs> it was almost like the Bengals were an object of esteem. If you've ever been to a live sporting event or a concert, you know how to worship. You know how to worship. And if worshiping the wrong thing can bring so much joy and so much delight, I can imagine what would happen if we brought that into this room every Sunday to worship the right thing. Just imagine. If we came into this room with expectation and anticipation of what God might do among us, the God of the universe deserves our participation. The God of the universe deserves our singing. He deserves our clapping. He deserves our getting here on time. He deserves our staying here the whole time. He deserves our full intention, our full attention from the opening chord to the last prayer. Because he is our object of esteem. And when we give him that, his spirit moves in this room and it moves in our heart and something happens. Something happens that can only happen when we're together. And the Bible calls that something koinonia. Koinonia. And koinonia is a divine, intimate, holy unity among believers that's produced by the Holy Spirit when we come together. See, when we worship together, the Spirit moves in ways that never happens when we worship alone. Richard Foster, who wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline that I read years and years ago. I love what he says. He says, to stand before the Holy One of eternity is to change. In worship, an increased power steals its way into the heart sanctuary. An increased compassion grows in the soul. To worship is to change. It's not a matter of knowing how. We all know how. It's a matter of knowing who. And the only one who deserves our worship is the one who gave his life for you and me. So we're going to spend a few minutes right now in communion where we're going to take a piece of bread and we're going to drink a cup of juice that reminds us that Jesus and Jesus alone is the object of our esteem, the object of our worship, and we come to him in this posture of humility and expectancy and worship. We pray for us. Father, your word tells us that, that when we view your mercy, there's only one response. And that is to offer our bodies 
as a living sacrifice to you. And it says that is our spiritual act of worship. And so we, we bow down before you right now in our hearts. We kneel before you. And we thank you for your sacrifice. And we offer you a sacrifice of praise in return. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand with us and let's worship together. You guys know this song, so sing it along with us.
there's, there's truth in those words. And I hope you paid attention to them. There's, there's power that breaks off every chain. Somebody needed to hear that today. Somebody needed to sing that today. It's why we do what we do. And if, if, you are, if you're new to faith, you're exploring faith, and you want to have a conversation about this God that we worship, we would love to have that conversation. We invite you to come down front. Some of our elders will be down here uh, and, when, and ha- can have that conversation with you. If you just need somebody to pray over you uh, this morning, they're available to do that as well. We, we, had, we had two Chiefs fans last hour that repented and accepted Jesus, and it was, it was great. No. <laughs> no, but you pray for them, though. Okay, you pray for them. Friends, next week we're going to do it again. I hope to see you there. Have a great week. Thanks so much for being here today. Whether you're on your way to serve the community, to meet with your small group, or just heading home, take some time to connect with people on your way out. Have a great week. We'll see you back here next Sunday. Hi, my name is Jenny Bussey, and I'm the student pastor here at Centerpoint. I just wanted to drop a quick reminder about Centerpoint students. We are currently offering student worship and small groups every Sunday downstairs in our student center. Middle school, grades six through eight, meets on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. And high school, grades nine through 12, Sunday evenings from six to 8 p.m. Students, if you're a little shy about joining us on Sunday, we have an event coming up that might be the perfect introduction. All students, grades six through 12, are invited to kick off the big game at our tailgate party on February 12th at noon in the Student Center. Food, games, and prizes. If you're feeling brave, test your skills and compete in our second annual CPSM Combine. Bring your favorite snack food to share and your friends. Let's go, we'll see you there. If you are a Christian working in a secular job, you understand the challenges of living out your faith in the workplace. Do you sometimes feel you need to advocate for causes you don't believe in? Would you like to live out your faith comfortably without offending others? Well, the Faith at Work Summit addresses these challenges and provides you with practical tools and techniques to confidently live out your faith at work. Join us in learning and exchanging of Faith at Work ideas with other Christians on Saturday, February 25th from 8.30 to noon right here at Centerpoint. You can find out more and register at cpcc.church slash events. Libby! Oh, hey, Tammy. I'm so excited to see a movie. I am too. When's the last movie you saw? You know, it's really been a while because like, it's so cold out and <laughs> I don't like to leave, but it's so expensive. It is expensive, especially for a family to go to I a movie right and then now. When you get snacks and everything. So, oh, I know the, the, the big, large popcorn. Oh, I don't yeah. even know how much that costs anymore. And the candy. I, oh, yeah. yeah. All right, so here's the good news. What? We've got a free yes. movie night. Right Come, here. Right here at Centerpoint in our big worship room. We're going to show a movie on that big, humongous LED screen. It's going to be fantastic. And yep. you know what? It's free. It's free. And we're going to have popcorn, and we're going to have candy. What's your favorite candy? Oh, probably, gosh, movie candy. I kind of like the M&M's in the box. M&M's in the box? Mm-hmm. How about M&M's inside your popcorn? Oh, yeah. It doesn't get better than but, that. I'm yeah. telling you. We yeah. will have candy. We will have popcorn. We will have maybe some prizes for the yeah. kids. And we'll... it'll be nice and toasty warm here, too. Yeah, and you know what? It is Friday, February 17th, which is President's Day weekend, which means, well, it's a Friday night, so you don't have school the next day, but I think you're off to school that the whole on Monday, yeah, too. Nice so long weekend. You need something to do. So come on Friday night, February 17th. The movie starts at 7. Okay. Come a little early to get your treats and get all set. Bring a blanket if you want to. Bring a friend. Bring a friend. Bring a pillow. Yep. Wear your pajamas. Yep. Wear whatever you want. That's right. pants. It's family movie night. So bring your entire family. It's going to be a ton of fun. And we can't wait to see you there. Yep. 